We're back, Mike. Yeah, we are. I couldn't go to the beach or anything or take a trip because it was too short of a thing. But I feel like with all my meditative staying inside out of the rain that I got a, a suntan inside my body, you know, with all my sunny <laughs> thoughts that I had this week. We're back after a rare week off. They're getting less rare, I think. <laughs> but we'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> we'll see. Sometimes you just need that week off. You know, life catches up with you, you know? That's right. Well, this mm -hmm. week is a blast from the past. Really caught up with me because my best friend from my school mm -hmm. days in the U.S. all the way from elementary school on up to university, who mm -hmm. after <laughs> we talked about it, it's been almost 25 years since I've seen him. So there was mm -hmm. a lot to catch up on, and I got to play tourist in my adopted country, running all over Western Japan here and uh, eating out every night. I think I gained about five pounds in that week, right, going around yeah. mixing it all up. So that was a good time. And, well, we had our own little blast from the past this week, too, Mike. Yeah, you and I went for spicy Chinese food. You want to talk about that? I'm looking at a picture here. We're not visual, so no one else can see it. Of uh, younger versions of ourselves. This picture goes back to the year 2000. Wow. And we're in front of this Chinese restaurant that I really liked. And I hadn't been to in about 20 years. And we decided to go back there. And so going back to those days, that's when the seeds of adult music were first sown. When we used yeah. to get together and just listen to music and talk about it together all the way back. So that's 24 right. years ago. Yeah, that was back in your, your old apartment there too, before we had the uh, Mountain Lair. That was the apartment before the apartment before the before mountain the mountain layer. layer. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, formative years of musical ideas of sharing, and now everybody else is invited in on our conversation. So, thanks for joining us here at Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind, bringing you the recent releases in classical and jazz that we think are most interesting. And this is going to be episode one hundred and fifty-seven. Before we move on into this week's program. Going back to the last episode, I want to give a thanks to David Larson for sharing our episode on both of his Facebook pages. We discussed his recording, Cohesion. It's really cool. Barry Sachs and Tenor Sachs. If you haven't heard that one yet, go back and check it out. We've got a few pieces of news from this week in the musical world. Two bits of sad news, really. Yeah. The first is uh, that the American pianist Byron Janis died. Now, he was uh, closing in on 96 years old, which is pretty... Uh, Pretty good age. I've been reading a lot of the um, remembrances from his students. Right. Now, I don't really know much about him, to be honest, because he uh, stopped playing before I was really, you know, listening. He was born in the 1920s, of course, and he stopped playing around 1973 because he had arthritis or something oh. like that. But he was um, a really important pianist because he was one of those like Van Cliburn who went to the Soviet Union to thaw out. You know, he didn't go by himself like, uh, who's that basketball player that goes to North Korea? <laughs> Dennis Rodman. <laughs> Dennis Rodman. He wasn't like Dennis Rodman. He was actually sent, I think, by the U.S. government. You know, okay. Or not sent, but, you know, he was part of the thaw of the time because, you know, the Soviets were really into music. Mm -hmm. So among other people, like Van Cliburn did that too. So rest in peace, Byron Janis. Also, other sad news, and this is really more appalling than sad. <laughs> I was reading about the St. John's College Cambridge Choir, known as St. John's Voices, have been disbanded by the college. They, yeah. they didn't just decide we're not doing this anymore. The uh, college said, you know, we can't afford you anymore. Later. Wow. <laughs> and now there's a lot of um, stuff online. There's a petition going around. People might want to sign that. Uh, we would encourage you to do that. This choir has been around only for 11 years. And in classical music, things happen slowly. All right, you got to build up a career. Now, this uh, ensemble was starting to make uh, albums just right. recently. I think the first one was in um, 2020. They did a William Mathias album. And then there was a great one last year of the composer Chesnikov. They did an album mm -hmm. of his music last year, and it was really great. And I really should have put it on the podcast, but you know, didn't think of it at the time because I figured, ah, we'll just do the next one. And now there might not be any more, although they say they have three releases, so there might be a third one mm. coming soon. So if they do, I'll definitely uh, do. We'll talk about that on the podcast, definitely. So you might want to go and sign their petition to try to keep that choir going because they're really great. Also, it's a mixed choir now. St. John's College Cambridge now has a main choir that has men's and women's voices in it. So if they get rid of this one, now the women have one less choir to sing in. There are plenty of men's voices only choirs. They go back in history. And this right. is a new one. They were just starting to find their feet and now they're just being disbanded. Everybody's shocked. It's just terrible news. So support the choir. 
St. John's Voices, St. John's College, Cambridge, try to get them reinstated. And we'll talk about them if they do a new album. Their other two albums are both on Naxos, so check those out. Chesnikov and Matthias, William Matthias. Right, and moving on to this week's content, as always in the episode description, you'll find links to Spotify and Apple Music for all the music that we're going to discuss. And at the top of the description, there's a link to the full episode playlist. That's all the music in one place on Deezer, CD quality streaming music from France. And I have a feeling that this episode's title is going to be something related to France, Mike. Yeah, I think so too. We don't have a lot of recordings of French composers or artists, but we have a lot of French related titles, yeah. themes, you know, hmm. or close to France. It's sort of, it's kind of Frenchy. You can also listen to the podcast on Deezer if you want to get the music and podcast all in one place. And if you can't see the full description or recording list and links are not easy to access on whatever app or platform you listen to us on, you can always come over and check us out on our host site. That's podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com, where everything is easy to follow for this and all previous episodes. If you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe. Tell a music-loving friend that helps us get new listeners. If you take a moment to give us a ranking or write a review, that also helps get us listed in the music category recommendations, another way that we find new listeners. Also, come follow us on our Facebook page to get extra info and more new releases throughout the week. You can see our handsome faces and interaction with the artists. You can leave a message or comment there as well. And if you'd like to contact us directly with any comments or questions, our email address is adultmusicpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We want to recommend, as always, our friends AJ and Johnny over at The Same Difference, Two Jazz Fans, One Jazz Standard Podcast. They look at several versions of The Same Jazz Standard in each episode that comes out twice a month. They play little snippets from each version. They discuss the history, have a lot of fun, get some humor mixed in there as well, and you can hear their ideas on the different versions of those standards. There's a link to their podcast in the description. And if you stick around to the end of this episode, you can also check out their little audio promo. Just like the same difference, guys, we also play samples of the music so you can get a better idea of it. And here is our fair use disclaimer. Music sample clips are for commentary and educational purposes. We recommend that listeners listen to the complete recordings, all of which are available on streaming services in the links provided. We also suggest that if you enjoy the music, you consider purchasing the CDs or high quality downloads to support the artists. Okay, so without further ado, let's get French fried. Wait, wait, did I just wait, <laughs> the did I just say French fried? <laughs> I mean, Frenchified. I think I made up a new word there. I think you did. Yeah. I like it. That's my American it coming out. I can't, you, you can't get me. You take the American out of America, but you can't take the American. Wait, I didn't even say that right. I don't even know. What <laughs> What's going on, Mike? <laughs> I don't know. Now I got to talk about like serious music here. I don't know how I'm going to okay. do this. Anyway, let's go on. Our first album is actually not a uh, French composer. He is um Swedish Bohemian. Oh. Anton Edvard Prate. Now, we've talked about his music before. Right, yeah. Yeah, on uh, episode 50, which was on February 14th, 2022. So that's uh, two years ago. Now, wow, time is flying. That was of uh, a Prate harp concerto, and we liked that. It was a beautiful recording. This is a recording of uh, Prate's chamber music, and I love chamber music, and I love the harp. Prate himself is a harpist. And this is his Quartet for Harp and Winds, Opus 154, and his Quartet for Harp and Strings. Opus yeah. 155. So I guess he wrote these back to back. The harpist on this album is Delphine Constantine Reznik. Reznik. She was the soloist on that grand concerto for harp and orchestra album released by Beasts that we talked about way back in episode 50. And uh, she is Swedish French. So there you go. There's our little French uh, flavor in there right there. The other musicians on this album are Cecilia Zilikas on violin, Ivali McTeeger Zilikas on viola, Kati. Reitinen on cello, Stefan Martinson clarinet, Roman Resnick bassoon, and that is Delphine Constantine Resnick's husband, and Anamia Larsen on the horn. The label for this album is DB Productions Sweden. So this is a minor label. I don't know much mm. about them. I tried to get in touch with them, and they I couldn't figure out how. So I wrote <laughs> straight to uh, Delphine Constantine Resnick, and she wrote back right away. She just oh. sent me a booklet. Uh, very nice of her. So we're going to have to send her a copy of this uh, talk and a thank you, I think, okay, yeah. for that. So thank you, Delphine. Okay, so going to the composer, Prate was a Swedish bohemian harpist and composer born into a family of puppeteers 
What a childhood that must have been. Um, who were extremely popular and traveled widely in Northern and Central Europe. These two pieces on this album were only rediscovered in the archives in 2020. So they're really brand new yeah, wow. for our ears. Delphine Constantine Resnick and her husband, Roman Resnick, who will also hear on this album. He's playing the bassoon, as I said. They re-premiered the Harp and Wing Quintet on YouTube with musicians from the Noor Köping Symphony Orchestra during the pandemic. So you can go to YouTube and probably see that performance. The Quartet for Harp and Strings was re-premiered in its original and complete version in 2023, just last year, hmm. by the Zillicus Trio and Konstantin Resnick in the Church of Ledberg. Both works are similarly shaped, and in fact, well, I'll have something to say about that. I'll give you a few samples of this as well. First, we're gonna hear the quartet for harp, violin, viola, and cello, so harp and strings, basically. It's a four movement work. The first movement, is Allegro con Brio, and this starts rather like a Mozart work. In fact, I think Prate liked Mozart's music a lot because he does tend to uh, use it as a model, let's mm. say, for what he's doing here. This particular one, uh, the opening reminds me of one of the piano concertos, which one it was didn't come immediately to mind. With the strings playing the theme and the harp responding, having the harp where there'd normally be a piano gives a lighter and prettier effect. Uh, the sound of the recording is fine, it begins on the more reverberant side and then has a non-glossy finish to the strings. It all comes up clearly. Characterization of the themes is fantastic, especially by the harp. And I want to go in a little bit to listen to this. We're going to start this at a minute into the work and give you a sample of what this sounds like. <laughs> cadence there and I'm just yeah. I've already played quite a bit of that so I'm gonna have to get out anyway the music is engaging and straightforward as you heard and we have that pretty glittery harp it sounds great I really like the melody a lot too there's a full cadence at uh, 3 minute and 20 seconds and even extended in a Mozartian style I hear Mozart all over this music to be <laughs> honest we goes directly into a development section at 3 minutes and 50 seconds which goes for some drama in the breaking up of the string themes and harmony at 6 minutes and 54 seconds, we arrive at the recapitulation, and the lightly dancing second theme comes up especially well in the harp just past the 8-minute mark. The recapitulation continues in the standard classical fashion to the end. The second movement is a scherzo, and I really like Prate's scherzi. This one's marked molto vivace, and it has a bit of a mysterious theme to it. Classical style, but this one isn't really very Mozart sounding at all. Let's hear this from the beginning. <laughs> theme extends after that into a different section. So it has kind of a folk character to it, like a dancey character. The theme has a lighter middle section to it, and it then moves to a trio after the opening is repeated. The trio starts at 2 minutes and 29 seconds, if you want to go and sample that on your own, and is nostalgic in an old dance sort of way. It's got a yearning quality to it, and is calmer and lighter than the opening. From 4 minutes on, the opening scherzo material repeats, then we get to movement three, track three, Adagio, the slow movement. The opening is thoughtfully and meditatively played solo by Konstantin Resnick. Let's hear her artistry here. This sounds really great.
Did we get a little repeat there? And apologies to people who are listening to our podcast in the car, because I'm sure that the roads <laughs> <laughs> just completely erased all of that. But if you can get into a quiet location, it's really pretty. It'll just kind of soften up the daily armor that we uh, carry around on us in the uh, modern world. Anyway, the theme repeats by the strings at the minute and five second mark with the harp only punctuating the chords on the downbeat. In the third minute, the strings play winding melodies wrapping around each other in appealing fashion. And around the five minute and 40 second mark, the opening material repeats, this time with the strings accompanying. We hear them together here, the strings mostly playing chords together. Nice harp harmonics are heard at the end, followed by a movement ending arpeggio. And the final movement, the finale, movement four, track four, features a sparkling, lively, and rising theme in the harp. Let's hear a bit of that. That's plenty. <laughs> I don't want to get hit for a copyright infringement there. Anyway, the strings come in answering the beginning of the harp's phrases in the next section of the theme. At 52 seconds, we reach a cadence, and the opening material is begun again on the harp, but is orchestrated differently this time with strings more heavily involved. The movement keeps up its rhythmic energy throughout. A solid cadence is reached again at 3 minutes and 18 seconds, and after this, the music darkens a bit and becomes a bit more aggressive for developmental material, but it's always pleasant to listen to. The harp's themes are especially appealing with its climbing motifs. It sounds like we're back to the main melody at around the 4 minute and 40 second mark. A full cadence is reached at 521, and we get a repeat of gentler material from the opening sections. The string takes the music into less stable harmonic territory, at around the 6 minute and 50 second mark, but the music never strays far from its sunny opening harmony and reaches its solid final cadence. It's an appealing movement throughout, and really an appealing piece throughout as well. Tracks 5 through 8 are the quartet for harp and winds, in this case harp, clarinet, horn, and bassoon, opus 154. So this one's the earlier one in the opus listings. They were probably written at about the same time, I'd say, though. The first movement, track 5, Allegro Maestoso, which would be the introduction, moving to Allegro Moderato e Cantabile. The sound really changes here. There's a kind of a more cavernous sound on the opening, but the music itself is pretty interesting. Let me just play the opening and you can judge this for yourself. Okay, so that's an introduction. It recalls the way Mozart writes again. Uh, the wind writing reminds me of the Gran Partita by Mozart. We get a romantic harp arpeggio before going into the first theme at 1 minute and 36, and the sound comes into focus a bit more here with the French horn. It's like the entire uh, sound picture sort of clears up. Listen to this. It's going to sound a lot different sonically than the opening did. Right, so I'm kind of wondering about that. Was the introduction recorded at a different time than the uh, hmm. that main theme? Or were the balances set for the French horn and that just made everything snap into focus? I'm not really sure. Anyway, it sounds great now from the minute and 38 second part on. 
The harp comes up now in all of its sensitivity, and it's a pretty piece. The harp gets a few extended periods in the spotlight, such as when it plays the second theme at 4 minutes and 26 seconds. At 6 minutes and 13 seconds, we hear the French horn theme again, and the development being practically non-existent. I think this is really mostly a thematic movement. It's all lovely melodies in this movement. The second movement, which is track six, is again a scherzo. As I mentioned, Prate has a flair for scherzo themes. This particular one has a skittish quality to it, similar to the one in the previous quartet, and it's got an appealing 6-8 feel. Let's hear the opening of this. So it had that Siciliano rhythm to it. At a minute and 50 seconds, a gentler waltzing theme comes into the trio section. At 2.50, the opening scherzo theme returns. The third movement, Andante Sostenuto, has an enchanting theme on the solo harp, opening the movement. And again, this is going to be one of those road noise <laughs> canceling <laughs> themes, but let's hear it anyway. Maybe you're in your living room. It offers equally beautiful accompaniment for the winds when they repeat the thematic material, and we get a change of melodic profile in the second minute. Here the wind writing opens up with the clarinet taking the lead, the harp then duets with the French horn, two instruments with the sound good together, as it turns out. After some more melodizing, the solo harp brings the material back to the opening theme towards the end of the fifth minute, and the movement heads to a tranquil ending from there. And we finally get the fourth movement, track eight, Rondo Finale. This is a rondo. The harp plays a gently sparkling theme to open the rondo finale, with the French horn commenting on the theme. Let's hear the theme. Some of that technique there reminds me of Mozart again. The first episode after the rondo theme features some lovely harp effects. The rondo's return features the theme played at faster speed as though rushing away from the first episode. At the 4 minute and 20 second mark, the second episode begins with a bit of trepidation in its tone, but the presence of the harp always makes it sparkle. The harp also gets some glittering figuration here. At 5 minutes and 48 seconds, we get a cheerful return of the rondo, and the movement and piece heads to its end with a build-up to the final cadence. I personally am always happy to hear the harp, whether it's in classical or jazz recordings. Uh, we really don't hear enough of it, I think. Here it's played in the traditional angelic fashion by Delphine Constantine Resnick in these works. This music is clearly written for entertainment purposes and to showcase the harpist's abilities. Constantine Resnick is very much the star on this album and in fact really makes the music come alive. I imagine Prate wrote the works for the purpose of showcasing his abilities, and this serves Konstantin Resnick's style well. She gets a lot of sensitivity out of the instrument. There's great technique and virtuosic passages. It's really a good listen, especially if you like the harp. She gets excellent support from the other players, who are often playing as a group. The music itself is not adventurous. It's pretty straightforward. But nevertheless, it's highly appealing in its thematic material, not to mention its enchanting writing for the harp 
and the harp comes up, as you heard, well on this recording, too. Oh, and by the way, I want to thank Daniel Bernardson for alerting us to this release. He remembered that we had done the Prate Grand Concerto mm -hmm. two years ago and let us know that this was here. It's a small label. I probably wouldn't have noticed it on my own. So thank you, Daniel. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Over at the Runitsky Project, and we're always hoping for new music from Runitsky. We hear there's something coming up probably in the fall, so looking right. forward to that, too. Me, too. Yeah, this was a really pleasant recording overall. The harp takes on various characteristics, I thought. There's the usual strummy, angelic type thing, like yeah. you mentioned. But there's also more piano-like parts. Also was kind of impressed by the percussive and chimey sections in certain places. And then also, in contrast, there's a lot of soft dynamics that really pull you in. And it can be really gentle in attack and really soft relative to some of the more boisterous sections. I really liked the quartet with winds myself because of the charming timbres, especially the bassoon and the horn mixed in there. So I really enjoyed listening to all those tones mixing together with the loveliness of the harp. So you can't really find anything not to like about this recording. I really like the, uh, the French horns, the, the boldness of that sound is very yeah. different than everything else. And the bassoon, it's one of those low winds. I just like low reed instruments a lot. <laughs> just we, You know how we are on this podcast about that, you know, the baritone sax, the bassoon bass clarinet <laughs> anytime we could hear any of those we've got some bass clarinet coming up later indeed we do that's in the jazz section right i want to encourage the classical uh, listeners here to uh listen to the jazz section too because you should be listening to both it's all really Absolutely. great music yeah we do after all all right next we go on to our i think this is our only french composer on the uh, program chasson and then we have a belgian composer le Q, chamber works this is played by Gabriel Le Magadour on the violin and Frank Braley on the piano. And the Cateur Agat joins them in the Chasson piece, the Ernest Chasson. By the way, Le Magadour is a violinist in the Cateur Aben, an ensemble that we really like a lot on this podcast. So it's pretty exciting, really. This is on the Appassionato Le Label label, and it was released on March 1st, 2024. I'd like to thank Leo Dumen for sending me a digital booklet for this recording. He's the label's director, and the director of what I'm guessing is the label's orchestra, too. The ensemble is called Appassionato. They're not on this album, though. Both composers on this album shared a fascination with Wagner. The music has the expected impressionist colors and sound palettes of the time, but the composer's sometimes operatic language is also stamped with drama, jubilation, terror and euphoria. I would even say histrionics <laughs> in there. I'll point those out when they come up. The music is highly influenced by Wagner's Tristan und die Solde. Now, if you remember what that was like, building to a cadence and then like slipping away to another unexpected key and avoiding that cadence so you just don't get that satisfaction until the very end. Both pieces, by the way, were also dedicated to the violinist Eugène Isai, the Belgian violinist. So this works out pretty well. Anyway, the first piece as by the French composer Ernest Chasson, Concert in D Major for Piano, Violin, and String Quartet, Opus 21. <laughs> that's kind of an odd yeah. pairing, because you have a string quartet that's two violins right there. And then there's a solo violin, so there are three violins in this right. piece. You rarely hear that. This is an odd combination, as I said. This allows the piece to be a duo, a quartet, a quintet, and a sextet at various times. You can really like uh, jumble up the orchestration to make it sound like a lot of different textures and even pieces. Chausson, by the way, died at only 44 years of age. So both composers on this album were short-lived. That's another theme <laughs> that we're going to hear on this album, sadly. Anyway, tracks one through four are the Ernest Chausson piece. The first movement is Décidé, moving to Calme, moving to Anime. This starts thunderously on the piano with octaves that the string quartet repeats. Okay, now an octave melody is a bold statement. There's no harmony coloring it. You don't really know what key you're in. It's like you're just kind of being, somebody's like shaking you by the shoulders when you hear this. Then we get some soft harmonized versions of the opening line from the string quartet after that. Let's listen to this. Fasten your seatbelt, ready?
And I'm not going to wait for a cadence because I have no idea when it comes. <laughs> they keep avoiding them. So far, you heard that motif, bum, bum, bum. And that's really all we heard. It got repeated a lot. That's going to be the big structuring element in this work. We're going to hear it often. It's a compelling opening expertly executed and captured by the fantastic sounding recording. So congratulations to the Appassionato Le Label label here because uh, they came up with great sound on this. Yeah. Braley's piano has real presence. The opening three note motif is expanded on. And finally, at a minute and 41 seconds, the violin solo comes in. So we really hear Le Magadour solo for the first time here. And I'm going to play that entry too. Let's hear this. And there it is, that evaded cadence. We didn't get the cadence there. We just went off in another direction. I'm sure if any of you are familiar with Tristan Undisolda, I'm sure you heard the influences in that melody, as well as the opening three notes right at the very beginning, which is that motif from the beginning. Now, Le Magadour is in the Eben Quartet, as I mentioned. And hearing him solo here is a real revelation, though I guess it shouldn't be, uh, given the sound that the Eben produces. He gets a highly emotive soloist sound, and one wonders if he shouldn't have pursued a career as a soloist. I guess I'm glad he didn't, because <laughs> I love the Aben Quartet. His entry really makes an impression there. Braley and Le Magadour sound fantastic together, each with highly emotive approaches to the playing. The piece itself is interesting, with the textures changing from section to section. Sometimes it sounds like a duo, sometimes a sextet, sometimes a quintet. The instrumentation leaves room for a lot of possibilities. At 4 minutes and 30 seconds, we hear a gentle theme in the violin, gently accompanied by piano, who then gets a romantic-sounding solo section. At 6 minutes and 24 seconds, the quartet come in with a new section, accompanied by piano, so we're hearing a piano quintet then. The solo violin eventually comes in to make a full sextet and takes the melodic lead. The piano has a lot of rushing figures that act as a bed for the solo violin. At 8 minutes and 33 seconds, the section reaches a histrionic climax and we're greeted with a dramatic return of the opening three note motif. Easy to remember on only a single listen. At 9 minutes and 40 seconds, there's some beautiful melodic playing on the violin. Le Magador's playing really grabs the attention throughout this movement and album. The movement continues to build in drama and emotion, and you can hear the Wagnerian, even proto early Schoenbergian influence in its pushing of the emotion. I mentioned Schoenberg because um, his early, like, romantic works, this kind of reminded me a bit of his string sextet, Verklärte Nacht, in pieces, which hadn't been written at the time of this piece. Mm. So this, this Chasson piece came first. The movement reaches a climax and quiets down for the approach to the warm final cadence. It's a, quite an action-packed movement. Okay, movement two, Sicilien. We're hearing quite a few Sicilian rhythms here. We heard one in the Prate album as well in the, one of the uh, scherzi, the one with the winds. But here we have another one. This melody here actually reminds me of something, and I can't put my finger on it. Let's listen, <laughs> and maybe it'll just pop into my head now, because I couldn't figure this out when I listened to it. I can't, oh, it's just not there, but it sounds <laughs> like another piece that I know, and I can't think of what it is. Anyway, the ensemble is beautifully balanced, and I especially liked the pianist's lead entry after the opening material. The material keeps the opening siciliano rhythm and sort of varies in melodic decoration and orchestration. 
As the movement nears its end, the orchestration becomes bolder and more, yes, histrionic, showing again the Wagnerian influence. <laughs> it quietens for a calm ending. Yeah, Chasson likes those histrionics. Movement three, grave. This is track three. The piano begins this with a creeping ostinato line, and the violin plays sighing two-note phrases. The violin solo line builds tension over the ticking piano ostinato, being sequenced up and finally downward. At the 2 minute and 10 second mark, there's a release of tension, then a new section with string chords plays. Some great sounds from the string ensemble here. The piano's line is embellished and a crescendo ensues, which has the solo violin playing in high romantic anguished tone at the peak of its phrase. Let's hear a little bit of that. We're going to hear Le Magadour at his peak here, I think. Again, to my ear, very Wagnerian. After a gorgeous chordal section from the quartet, we heard the beginning of it there, violin and piano lightly play themes with a dark tinge. At the 6 minute and 50 second mark, we hear a repeat of earlier material with histrionic material. It reaches a peak at 7 minutes and 48 seconds and does a dramatic cascading fall in the strings until landing on a new, unexpected harmony. We're in a new key and keep rising a la Wagner again. The movement has an extended ending with ghostly tones in the string quartet that finally ends on a cadential cadence. For the fourth movement, the finale, marked Tres Anime, we hear a very lively line on the piano opening the movement. This is what it sounds like. Wagnerian builds again. You just can't get away from Wagner in this work. That kind of theme kind of gives me a swashbuckling feel. Anyway, the strings repeat the theme. The opening material expands and develops in the strings with some quick Wagnerian amplifying of keys. At a minute and 50 seconds, we're hearing a new theme or the same notes in a different rhythm. It's new for all intents and purposes. Uh, this develops to its end, and at about the 3 minute and 30 second mark, a new active theme based on the opening piano line is heard, with the string quartet playing high in their range, producing intriguing combinations of sonorities. A buildup of tension in the sixth minute leads to a tapering off and a repeat of the skittish material from the beginning. The Magadur emotes throughout the movement whenever the solo line appears. I have to say, Braley sounds like he's playing a concerto himself, but even though he's not in the spotlight all that often. This does not sound like an easy piano part technically or especially balance-wise, but Braley manages to achieve both accuracy and balance with the ensemble. Just before the 10th minute, there's a big unison statement of one of the themes and a buildup of tension to the end, passing to ever higher keys until we land on the dramatically taken final chords. Okay, next we have Violent Sonata in G Major by Guillaume Lecoux. He was a Belgian composer, died at 24 years old, so before he even had a career, really. Classical music has a lot of people like this. You know, I think of Pergolesi from the Baroque era, and we all know that people like Chopin died pretty young, Mozart, but they were in their 30s. A lot of uh, young people, and Chausson at 44, that's very young too. And also, let's not forget uh, Lily Boulanger either, right. also died at about that same age, 24. I guess 24 is the uh, classical 27, you know? <laughs> That's the age 24 like, club, yeah. Maybe there's a 24 club in <laughs> classical music. I don't know. I'll have to look into that further. Anyway, the first movement is on track five. It starts très modéré, and then moving to vif et passionné. So there's a lovely pleading violin melody over piano chords. 
Let's hear the opening of the liqueur work. And the piano plays the theme. What beautiful tone from Le Magadour yeah. there. Just great tone and sensitivity. And do you notice how he shades his tone at about the 33 second mark? Really great. The piano plays a bit of the line after the violin's exposition. Then they come together, intertwining in a sensuous way. Rock-like chords follow with accented violin notes. Oh, I should mention, this is violin and piano only, by the way, in this piece. The string quartet is gone. This is a movement with a lot of strong emotion, and it's being communicated strongly in this performance. You can also hear sudden Wagnerian key changes, a la Tristan and Isolde. The theme repeats in the violin and is extended. The piano also extends its solo melody afterwards, bringing the movement into new keys. By the 3 minute and 50 second mark, Le Magadour's tone has lightened and sweetened, but passion is never far away. There's a huge outburst leading back to the theme at 5 minutes and 18 seconds. And then at 6.46, we get not only a passionate outburst, but an insistently loud ostinato line in the piano, driving the movement forward rhythmically for a brief period. It's a brief episode. Most of the episodes are in this movement, as the music repeatedly drops through wormholes into new keys. The Wagnerian element seems to be the driving force here. The music tends to vary rather than to develop. The main themes are never far away. They're all appealingly melodic and passionate. At 10 minutes and 23 seconds, there's some admirably ardent passion communicated by Le Magadour as he goes up high for an emphatically stated pattern. He then comes down, and the movement ends in a churchy mode, with chords tolling in the piano and the violin playing in a prayerful, chaste tone. Now, the three movements of this work are all like 10 minutes long, and if you're wondering why they're so long, it's because with all these sort of sudden key changes like Wagner did, it's going to take a long time for all of this to balance out and resolve. <laughs> and you just need a lot of time to do that. And that's why, for example, Mahler symphonies and Bruckner symphonies are so long too. They were very much under Wagner's influence. And uh, that meant lots of working out of material to get it all, to actually feel like it's in the key of the final chord. Anyway, track six is movement two, très lent. This is the uh, slow movement. And the piano starts us with a spare, rising bass line which the violin beautifully starts to melodize over. Let's hear a bit of that. And we're just never going to arrive at a cadence with a line like that. So let's dip out right there. The violin's melody is continuous, as you heard, and continually gorgeous. A cadence is reached at about the 3 minute and 42 second mark, and the piano introduces a new section, more tentative than the first. The violin comes across as shyer in this section, with the piano taking over for a lot of the melody. In the sixth minute, the piano and violin play a unison melody, as though the piano is guiding the violin. The violin takes off from there, and we're led to a gentle ending. It's a highly melodic movement. The final movement, marked Très Animé, this is track 7, starts fortissimo with the violin and piano both bursting out at the opening. The piano has fairly virtuosic lines. There's a brief march rhythm at around a minute and 20 seconds that quickly gives way to a building of tension line to a new key, again Wagnerian. At the 3 minute and 39 second mark, all of this dissipates to a sweeter theme. 
The piano's lines are reminiscent of the stormier moments of César Franck's violin sonata. There are sections that evoke those moments in the violin as well, but they're quickly swept away for new material. There's a really passionate build-up in the sixth minute that's interrupted several times. We're pulled around, wondering where the key will land. There are constant Wagnerian changes of key until we wind up on something stable for the final Russian cadence. And that's the whole album. We hear fantastically emotive performances, beautifully caught on this clear and well-balanced recording. Gabriel Le Magadour is a real find as a soloist, and I'd urge you to hear this recording for him alone. But there's so much more. Frank Braley is in a solo role for large stretches of the Chasson work, and the Cator Agat produces some enchanting sonorities as well as perfect timing in building tension. The Chasson work is pretty histrionic, but never gets out of control in this performance. All of the emotion is managed while the ensemble allows the work to keep its shape. Le Magador and Braley are no less energetic alone in the lecu. The first two movements are gorgeously melodic, while the third emotes with Frankian passion and Wagnerian instability until the end. There's a lot of music in each movement of these works, and for that reason, it's a pretty exhausting to listen to straight through. I divided my listening between the two pieces. They're both very long. The Wagnerian style just sort of demands that. But it's a very rewarding listen, and I think you'll really enjoy it. I thought the works go together very well in the program. As you mentioned and highlighted, they're very dramatic, Wagnerian influence, romantic in nature, in the composition, and passionately played to match. The violin with piano and string quartet achieves <laughs> a really large presence. It sounds huge sometimes. And then the sonata is more intimate, but it's still played with a lot of feeling. As you say, there's a lot of passion that may uh, wear you out a little bit. You may want to uh, break it up or even listen to maybe the sonata first. I'm not sure why they programmed it like this, but... I had the garden hose ready in case I needed to spray myself down, you know, <laughs> from getting all heated up. Too emotive, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? You're all set? I'm all set. Okay, and the final classical recording of this week is a recording of uh, String Sextets by Tchaikovsky and Eric Wolfgang Korngold. This is played by the Nash Ensemble, and it's on the Hyperion label, also released March 1st. Man, March 1st was a big day for yeah. recordings. I think the first week in April will be as well. On this album, I want to say I love the cover art. I usually don't mention the cover art, but uh, this one is a reproduction of uh, Plinio Nomellini's painting, Red Nymph, from around 1900. The vividness of the color is really striking. And I yeah. think matches the vividness of the recording, because this is a really great recording as well. The first four movements are a Tchaikovsky work that was once more familiar than it is now. We don't really hear this too often anymore. His string sextet in D minor, nicknamed a Souvenir de Florence, so Souvenir of Florence, Italy, Opus 70. It's a late work, first performed a year before Tchaikovsky died, and its title, Souvenir de Florence, was never explained, though Tchaikovsky's brother claimed that the melody heard over pizzicato accompaniment in the second movement was sketched in Florence in January 1890. So in other words, souvenir means in French, means a memory. Okay, so it's not quite the same as like an object that you bring to remember. Uh, right. That's something in, uh, in English. So the memory of Florence is the theme that we're going to hear. I'll point right. it out when we get there. All right, so the first movement, we have Allegro con Spirito, and it has the feeling of starting in media res, which means in the middle of things, sort of like that Nielsen Fourth Symphony, you know, works like that. Mm. Let's hear the opening of this. Now, I mentioned that the previous recording sounded really fantastic, but did you notice how much less opaque this recording is? It's really astonishing. You, you could almost isolate all six of the string instruments. The recording is so clear. At 52 seconds, a quieter theme emerges. It's sharp and has short bow strokes that make the music dramatic and lean sounding. 
Rhythm is accentuated in this performance, thankfully. I'm always happy about that. Even in the more melodic section at around the 1 minute and 30 second mark. Great ensemble playing with a Klangfarben melody-like passage at 2 minutes and 30 seconds, where each instrument plays a note of the melody, and the pizzicati at the end of the passage at 3 minutes come up sounding great too. Okay, now, Klangfarben melody means sound color melody, okay? And it's a word invented by Schoenberg, but the actual technique was first used by Berlioz in his Symphony Fantastique, where an individual different instrument plays a single note of a melody and they all kind of add up together. It's a really cool effect. Listen to that at the 2 minute and 30 second mark. This movement works like a sonata, and we're in the development section at around 3 minutes and 53 seconds. There are a lot of sudden changes of tempo and orchestration as well as of harmony. At 6 minutes and 25 seconds we hear the opening theme that we sampled again and are in the recapitulation. I love the second theme and I'm going to sample it here later on in the work. This is at about the 7 minute and 20 second mark. Again, notice the liveliness of the rhythm under the gorgeous melody, which will inevitably draw your ear. This is a really vivid performance, well captured on the recording. There's an exciting coda that builds in momentum to a big and very satisfying climax. The second movement opens unmistakably in the words of the composer's earlier Serenade for Strings of 1880, so it's a self-referential movement. The opening features vibratoless chords, played almost like a chorale, at the 42nd mark, we hear the Florence theme that I mentioned at the beginning, and I'll sample that for you so that you can kind of hear what the Souvenir de Florence is. Pizzicato accompaniment kind of reminds me a bit of uh, guitars, really. So you can just imagine like right. serenades happening somewhere in Florence there with that beautiful melody. Tchaikovsky is really one of those composers who had an innate gift for melody, sort of like uh, Mozart, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, and Gershwin. They just came up with great melodies all the time. One of the cellos eventually comes in to provide a counter melody and then takes the spotlight, trading the theme with the violin. The theme eventually fades into the washed out chords that I mentioned. They're in the high end and sound like they've lost their color in the sunlight, so I'm calling them washed out. It's not a bad thing. That we heard at the opening of the movement, making an interesting cycle. The whole section comes to a clear end at the 4 minute 40 second mark, and there's even a pause before the rushing middle section starts. At 5 minutes and 41 seconds, a cello melody starts with pizzicati and droning bass notes, and I've got a sample of this too. Let's hear that. The melody eventually finds its way to the rest of the ensemble and again arrives at the opening chords of the movement. Track 3 is movement 3, Allegretto Moderato. This and the next movement have a folk-like character, so let's hear that folk-like character right at the beginning.
To me, that sounds like a real Russian kind of folk character yeah, as well. So we have that ear-catching melody. I'm interested in the rhythm here, which propels that melody. And I keep using the word vivid, but it's very suitable for this performance. At the three-minute mark, a rushing middle section begins with quickly bowed patterns in the upper strings that give the section a light dance quality. We get a brief restatement of the opening to end the movement. And then track four, movement four, Allegro Vivace. The opening has a Russian-sounding D minor aeolian theme, so it's kind of modal, and then turns to counterpoint. The opening has an appealingly rustic sound to it. Let's sample that. The Nash Ensemble characterize each movement of this work exceptionally well. The tempo speeds and slows with the various iterations of that opening theme throughout the movement. There's some really gritty cello playing in the mid-movement, listen to around the 4 minute and 20 second mark, and the string texture leaps out of the speakers in a contrapuntal section. The Nash Ensemble dig into the strings to such an extent there. There's a doubling at the tempo as the work heads to its final cadence, which is reached with maximum energy. It's a great performance all around. And then a work we've heard on the podcast before, uh, tracks five through eight, Eric Wolfgang Korngold's String Sextet in D Major, Opus 19. This work was premiered a few weeks before the composer turned 20 years old. <laughs> Man, just a few weeks ago, we heard his piano trio, which I think he wrote when he was 11 or something, you know? <laughs> Boy. Now, the thing is, Korngold lived a fairly long life, but his career sort of changed when he had to leave Austria because of the Nazis. So he came to America, went to California, and composed um, Hollywood scores. And he's pretty famous for a lot of that. He really invented what we think of as the Hollywood sound from the 1940s and 50s, those big orchestral scores. They're good scores, but it would have been interesting to hear how he would have developed had he been able to live peacefully in Austria and had there been no war, and no Nazis or anything like that. Anyway, we have what we have. So this youthful work starts with the first movement, moderato, going to allegro. So it's an introduction and then a main theme. I like the tone the opening instrument gets. I think it's a viola. Let's listen to this. It's got that kind of ghostly tone of the viola, but you never really know. It could be a cello. Here we go. And we're only 30 seconds into this piece, and already all six of these instruments are sounding very independent of each other despite playing together. It's really interesting texture. A gently rocking rhythm emerges as the violins play that melody. I've heard melodies pull out of the texture with more contrast, but the Nash seem to want the passing themes to remain part of the texture that they emerge from. It works. You still notice those melodies, but you're really being drawn attention to the actual relationship between the uh, individual instruments as well in this performance. At 2 minutes and 21 seconds, we hear a second suite theme played over sul ponticello, tremolo accompaniment. Sul ponticello is when you bow on the bridge of the violin, and it gets a kind of more faded sort of ghostly sound. The Nash really go for some interesting sound choices to contrast material, such as the thinner vibratilist tone they get from around the 3 minute and 30 second mark, and I'm going to start a little earlier and give you a sample of that.
and a sudden change, a leap into some new material there. I love the way the false climax is approached and played later on at the 5 minute and 12 second mark, coming across with the surprise intended and launching us into a section with a slow harmonic climb. At the 6 minute mark, a contrapuntal section begins. When the counterpoint ends, we're in a recapitulation of the opening material. There's a gentle coda at the end of the movement, taking us to the final cadence. Track 6 is the second movement, the adagio, slow movement. It begins starkly with a sudden dissonance that puts us in a state of suspense. It's quickly dissipated by the viola, I think. Could be a cello again. And Corn Gold favors the viola's tone a lot in this work. The violin takes over the forlorn melody. There's a lovely settling down of the melody into what seems like it's going to be a cadence in the third minute, but the material keeps being extended until we're off into full statement of a theme in a new harmony. There's a harmonic kaleidoscope quality to this movement that one notices only if you listen to it from the beginning. I can't really give you that as a sample. It's an amazingly clever manipulation of harmony for a 20-year-old. The material continues on until about the 8 minute 40 second mark when we hear the opening suspenseful chord again and the forlorn material is back. Track 7 is the third movement, titled Intermezzo, Moderato con Grazia. The violin starts this out solo, with other strings coming in to provide harmony and counter themes. By the 45 second mark, there's a Viennese sounding dance theme. Let's hear that. This is very much of the Vienna period. some cool brief glissandos in there for effect as well. A little bit of comedy, I'd say. The dance theme goes to a cadence at the 2 minute and 37 second mark when the opening intertwining themes come back. The dance theme threatens to come back by 3 minutes and 30 seconds, but we hear its melody legato accompanied by chords minus the rhythm. The melody does get its dance rhythm back toward the end at around the 5 minute and 40 second mark, but it's more aggressive and keeps being lost by the intertwining material. The dance rhythm is played toward the end with no melody. We then hear the violin and viola play their respective themes to lead the movement to a solemn end. It's an interestingly composed movement, and I'd urge you to hear it. The fourth movement, track eight, is marked finale, and it's marked presto. This starts out at high speed and launches into a sort of quick dance. It seems to be a rondo in form. We get a departure and then we're back to the opening theme at a minute and 40 seconds or so. There's a playful quality to the orchestration with pizzicati added at key moments, giving a sense of fun. At the two minute and 42 second mark, we hear the opening theme again. The next departure from the theme has a slow floating quality to it. I wanted to sample this one too. The rondo theme slows down when it comes back and brings us toward the end, but there's a sudden burst of speed as we race to the final cadence. I got a lot of pleasure listening to this vivid, highly present recording. 
I've been listening to the Nash Ensemble for a long time now, and they've always been good, but they seem to be reaching new heights on this album. I especially like the attention paid to the rhythm and having it propel the piece forward, and the clear sound quality achieved by the engineer Oscar Torres and producer Andrew Keener. The Tchaikovsky is a relatively well-known work, but like Smetana on the last podcast, I haven't heard it recently, and it was a welcome treat, especially with a performance like this to give it such life. The same could be said for the Corn Gold, though that's seen quite a few recordings over the last 10 years. Okay, I could say this is one of the best, but it is a little different than the other ones in that it doesn't try to isolate the melodic material over the accompanimental material. It really wants you to hear everything and achieves that exceptionally well. This is a highly recommended release. The sextet format is interesting. Corn Gold seems to have used it more to his advantage than Tchaikovsky when you listen to the two back to back, just because of the thick textures and layers of parts doing interesting things. I enjoyed both works. The Tchaikovsky more for the great melodies. Like I said, it's just his natural sense. And it has that sort of larger presence with this sextet. But Korngold here is really interesting. He's got a lot of chromaticism. The moods are constantly changing, and there's a big variety of string techniques that keep popping up and make you wonder what they're doing <laughs> to get this sound here and there. Lots of pizzicati mm -hmm. mixed in. And yeah, you can just tell it's a genius mind at work with transitions and all sorts of ideas. And he's always an interesting composer to listen to. It would have been interesting, as you say, if he had continued in the same vein. But maybe that's yeah. why we enjoyed those old movies so much, because the music was really cool using his genius in that venue. Yeah, the Seahawk and movies like that. Right. Kornko's an interesting character. If anybody reads a biography of him, there is one out there, at least one. His father was a really famous music critic and was very influential in, how, really? in shaping mm. the music of Vienna. And he hated Schoenberg and his whole school <laughs> and attacked them. And because of that, his son, Eric, didn't get the exposure or the, the real love that he really could have gotten otherwise because right. uh, people were going after him because of his father. It's a really interesting life interesting. and it's a real shame. Mozart had similar problems with his father, but his father wasn't, his father was causing him problems directly and not. <laughs> Right. friends you know he was friendly with everybody else mozart's father anyway you got that father genius son <laughs> situation going on here again and i wanted to say a yeah, fine playing as always from the nash ensemble and great sound from hyperion as all the recordings crystal clear and yeah, really love great. presence on the ensemble okay moving on to the jazz side we're going to keep our French and other connections in this part of the episode. And we're going to have a trumpet thread running straight through all the three recordings. And we're going to start out with French trumpeter Julien Bertrand and his group, New Fly. And I should definitely check out the album cover on this one because it's quite <laughs> cute. <laughs> the uh, quintet there is portrayed all as little flies on the cover. And the title is Wax Men. It's on the Fresh Sound New Talent label, and it came out March 1st. Bertrand is a French trumpeter born in 1980. He studied trumpet at the Guare Conservatory and later classical music as well as improvisation. Most of the compositions on here are by Bertrand, except for two. We'll name them as they come along. So we've got Julien Bertrand on trumpet and flugelhorn, Liam Zimonic on alto sax, Etienne Deconfant on piano. François Régis Galix on bass and Arthur de Clerc on drums. This was recorded at Underpool Studio in Barcelona back in March of 2023. Sound engineer Sergei Felipe and mastering by Pierre de Vachter at Icus, Brussels. The recording begins with almost the title track. It's called Wax Man singular hmm. not plural like the title starts out with a four measure left hand piano and bass riff that goes around twice and then two more times joined by drums the minor modal melody is 32 measures and constantly evolving starting out mirroring the intro riff the horns split off into harmony over long bass notes a walking bass section with long horn notes and a final syncopated section with a break in the middle there's another eight measures of the intro idea and the melody repeats. Let's hear this tune get going.
the end of the second time through the melody, Bertrand is off soloing, and let's check out some of his playing to get a sense of his style later on in the tune. his melodic sense and building energy in this solo here. Simonic follows with an alto sax solo. He has a relaxed swing feel, but ideas that build an intensity. Working into the higher register, things come down softer for a piano solo from De Confin, also with a nice sense of swing and some zippy lines and punchy chords. They vamp on the intro riff for a while for De Klerk to build up some energy on the drums before a final run through the melody and a soft ending. Hey, Mike, Let's spread some love. All right, I'm always up for spreading some love. That's the name of track two. This tune has a lot of personality changes, so it won't be possible to sample everything that's going on. Bertrand starts this one out solo with some agile phrases and explorations, so let's hear some of that. Well, the main tune kicks in at about a minute and 45 seconds in. It's an even beat feel with a stop and start feeling to it. De Confon is on roads here, building atmosphere with washy chords. Seems to be about a 36 measure melody gaining energy. The rhythm section continues on a bit to a slowdown and hold. Then De Confon makes a fresh start with acoustic piano at a slow tempo joined by bass drums and then new delicate horn lines for a section that works back into the original tempo and feel. Galix has a cool bluesy bass solo with nice double stops in it, so let's check some of that out later on in the tune. After his bass solo, the horns are back, transitioning to the original melody idea and some improvised exchanges between Bertrand and Simonic, with the sax continuing on into a more extended solo before Bertrand re-enters and they join up on some final lines to the end. 
it kept me guessing about what will happen next right through the whole tune. Track three is Burning Brains, a rubato in mysterious start for this tune, with Patron and Zimonic building some tension with dissonance over the swelling rhythm section. It finally gets into a tempo before two minutes with a lot of interesting change-ups in groove under the horn melody, from rock to Latin to swing. Let's hear a bit of those changes in this tune. It's off swinging there with simultaneous sax and trumpet improvisations into some intense sax from Zimonic. Bertrand is back to join him, and the heavy rock feel is back as well. De Confond gets a bouncy piano solo before the horns are back with some of the melody we heard before to the end of the tune. Track four is a tune by Stacy Diard called Groove, and that groove is a thumping bass ostinato and clicky drum beat that gets things started. After eight measures, De Confond adds ringing chords, Bertrand is in for a 16 measures of improvised ideas, and then there are sections of legato horn lines that segment off a shorter sax section as well. Let's hear this one get going. De Confond gets to solo first on this one with a mix of rhythmic and flowing ideas, so let's hear some of his piano playing over this groove. Throne has an animated solo there with fun rhythmic half valve play, and it finishes suddenly with one of the horn lines we heard from earlier. Track five is Precious Feelings, a ballad on this one. It sounds like Bertrand is on flugelhorn, nice harmonies and weaving of the horn lines over the 32 measure melody section. Seems to be a 16 measure pattern around twice. Let's hear it get started.
After the melody, Bertrand continues on for a solo, keeping momentum with snappy phrases, and De Confin has a piano solo with a light touch and good sense of space before the horns are back with the final melody section. Track six is Fear and Healing. This tune has a cool groove in seven eighths time with a unique descending ostinato bass line. Simonic gets to come in blowing alone with darting angular lines on the sax. Let's hear this one get going. continues on with improvisations and then gets joined by Bertrand for arranged horn lines with fun jumpy intervals and Bertrand gets a solo that has snappy phrases and chromatic ideas in it so let's check out a little bit of his playing on this tune as well. tune ends up with a final section of the jumpy horn melody. Track seven, A Little One for The Little One. Mm, nice. A short tune, just two minutes and 18 seconds. It has a nice loping groove. After a four measure intro, Bertrand gets uh, 12 measures of improvised phrases, and the rest is mostly composed trumpet melody with some added sax harmonization. And the recording ends up with Penelope, a Wayne Shorter tune from his 1965 recording, etc. Galix gets it started with some interesting solo bass with fluttering figures and descending slides. He goes on for a minute and a half and gets joined by rubato, rippling piano, and cymbals. The horns add legato dreamy phrases, and then the espresso machine gets going as it takes off into a fast tempo horn melody over walking bass. Let's check it out from about two and a half minutes in to hear that transition. Keeps you guessing with the rhythm section stopping up sometimes there. De Confond gets a percolating piano solo, and Bertrand has a zippy trumpet solo too, reaching higher and higher in his lines. And Zemanik gets the final solo with a change up in groove to get going. So let's hear one more from him before this tune ends. Mm-hmm. 
both horns get back to the melody lines to take it to the end of the tune and the end of the recording. So I found this recording when it came out, checking the daily new releases as I always do, and I happened to choose it to share on our Facebook page. And uh, Julian noticed right away and thanked me for sharing it. And he follows us on Facebook on our podcast site too. So I thought, well, why not feature this? And I'm glad I did. We've got some fresh jazz from France, straight out of the post-bop tradition. It's fresh because the original compositions by Bertrand keep your interest with unexpected twists and turns over the melodies and arrangements with Zemonic's sax lines. Grooves and tempos change up in unexpected places, keeping things interesting. Bertrand isn't really a big chops player, but both he and Zemonic take chances in their solos, getting in and out of harmonically tricky spots and landing on their feet, and I always enjoy that sense of adventure. I like how they sometimes start off improvising together. You're not sure who's going to be the one to continue on in the solo. Exciting piano solos from De Confant and bass lines and solos from Galix too. And De Klerk can shift grooves in an instant and keeps everything all tight together. So definitely check out this recording. I really wonder if Bertrand is one of those players who like he'll write a composition that'll get him into like a, a kind of tight corner. And that when he's soloing, he doesn't really prepare for what he's going to do because he wants to see how he's going to get out of it. I'm right. kind of, I've got that impression because yeah. it does sound very spontaneous that way. I said that these were compositions were unpredictable too, and I thought that made them really interesting. And I liked uh, Bertrand's really raspy sound. He's got this the, his tone. It gives his uh, solos a bit of an edge. Mm. I really liked that. I came from a rock background, so I'm always happy to hear the hard-hitting drums. And people think of me as the classical guy, but... I was rock music when I was in college. You know, I just was just getting right. into classical music then. Okay. Yeah. Hard hitting drums. I'm always happy to hear those, of course. And uh, we get that here. Yeah. He gets pretty aggressive in the faster tracks. And there were some interesting approaches to solos where trumpet and sax played, you know, sometimes at the same time, complementing each other's approach as well. Piano provided contrast with a lighter, more elegant sound. And every track was different too. You really didn't know what you were going to hear right. <laughs> when one track ended and the next one started. I was particularly taken with the second track, Let's Spread Some Love, where each solo resulted in a completely different approach mm. from the rest of the band and the accompaniment as well. There would be actual pauses between solos to almost reset, you know? There are a lot of surprises like that on the album. So listen, and as they say, be prepared for the unexpected. Yeah, definitely. How can you be prepared for the unexpected? You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> That's what was great about this, so I enjoyed it. All right, and our second album is by pianist Chris Rottmeyer. It's called Being. It's on Shifting Paradigm Records. came out March 8th. Rottmeyer is a jazz pianist, composer, and also a vibraphonist. He lives in Madison, Wisconsin. He was a pianist for Walt Disney World from 1999 to 2020. wonder what that was like. I bet it was great, because I used to love hearing those guys. I've been to Disneyland in, uh, in Walt Disney World in Florida, and they play like ragtime piano a lot. It's oh. really cool. They're really good at it. It's going to get a good feel. 21 years. It must have been pretty good, yeah. I wonder if you wore that straw hat and the, the red and white striped <laughs> kind of like <laughs> turn of the century clothes, too. I don't know. Anyway, he's released three previous albums as a leader, Reactive Synthesis in 2013, Sunday at Pilar's in 2019, and So in Love in 2020. He's currently the instructor of jazz piano at the University of South Florida, where he's taught since 2007, and he's also pursuing a DMA in piano performance at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he holds a teaching assistantship in the theory department. This recording, Being, is his fourth album, and it's a collection of original music written as part of a study of pianist Mulgrew Miller and his recordings with the Woody Shaw Quintet. And what's with all the French titles on this album? I know. <laughs> you know it sounds like it's just going to be an American sounding record, but he's got all these like original compositions with French titles. It's pretty yeah. interesting. I'm wondering about that. Another French connection. Yeah. So trumpet and flugelhorn Russ Johnson... Matt Andrus on drums, and Rufus Reed, the great Rufus Reed on acoustic bass. Tracked and mixed at Audio for the Arts, tracking and mixing engineer Audrey Martinovich. Mastered at Mystery Room Mastering, mastering engineer Justin Perkins, and produced by Chris Rottmeyer and Peter Dominguez. Now, the music of Woody Shaw is always something that draws my ear, because I grew up listening to that and trying to copy his trumpet solos back in my high school days. And of course, we heard Jason Kaiser's Woody's Groove last year. We got to hear a fresh interpretation on that with interesting arrangements. We're going to have another connection to that in the final album on 
today's episode too. So lots of connections going together in this episode. And here, since these compositions are inspired by Mulgrew Miller and Woody Shaw's recordings together, I think you might pick up on some connections to some of his recordings if you're familiar with that music. The recording starts out with On the Street Where Woody Lives. It gets started out with a 16-measure rhythm section intro with a cool bouncy left-hand piano and bass line. Johnson is in on the melody, which has an interesting structure and rhythmic change-ups. It's kind of reminiscent of the Green Street Caper from the United album, Woody Shaw's United album. There's a 12-measure section split into eight and four measures, the latter having kind of Woody Shaw type phrases. Then Rottmeyer takes over for eight measures over walking bass. The pattern repeats with Johnson taking the second section and continuing on into a solo. Let's hear it from the melody at 19 seconds in or so. Johnson continuing on there with a happy sounding solo with skillful harmonic navigation and Rottmeyer follows with the solo too. He's got a great bouncy feel and I'm drawn to the punchy rhythms and stabs of his left hand. Let's take a listen to a little bit of that. Back to the melody from there and an outro to match the intro with Andres mixing it up on the drums before a final trumpet line to end it. Track two is Reunited. Andres gets it started on the drums and Rottmeyer joins in with right hand piano phrases. Johnson is on the flugelhorn melody and although the tune is quite different, there's a nod to the trumpet phrase from the tune United on the previously mentioned album. The melody is a 16 measure construction and Johnson continues on into a solo. Let's hear some of his playing on this tune. interesting melodic ideas and phrasing there and Reed's bass is really chugging below. 
Rottmeier has a piano solo next. I like the suspense he builds in gaps between phrases here. And Rufus Reed has a great melodic bass solo with a ringing and singing tone. Andres gets to take a round on drums and continue on trading fours with trumpet and piano before Johnson gets another round on the melody, and Rottmeier finishes it up over the drums like at the start. All right, we're off to Paris here, Mike. Yes, we are. Bigal, which is... Uh, it's an area in the city, isn't it? It's where the uh, Moulin Rouge is. Right. And if you saw the movie Amélie, it's where Amélie Poulain's... Uh, workplaces her uh, cafe it's still oh, okay. there apparently the hmm. same place anyway on this tune rottmeyer gets it off to a start with soft piano in an intro over ringing bass harmonics from reed johnson is in on the longing minor waltzing melody it's an aab form with 16 measure sections let's hear some of it from where the trumpet comes in Nice little piano ripples there before the repeat of the A. And the B section gets a harmonic lift with new harmonies. And then Reed rings harmonics into another singing bass solo. We should hear a little bit of that on this tune. Rottmeyer has a restrained and pretty solo with a sense of increasing weight in his playing, and Johnson returns with the melody to finish it up with some final harmonics from Reed's bass. It kind of sounds like a lonely, rainy night in uh, Paris there. Yeah, really yeah. gentle playing. And we're going to stay in Paris for the next track. And we are. Uh, Chatelet is also another location. Right. I think it's a Paris. metro station there, too. Well, it's a square. You know, okay. the, the metro station lets out into the square. I think it's kind of close to the Pompidou Center if my internal map is still okay. <laughs> it's on the right bank of the Seine. This one starts out with a 16-measure drum intro from Andres. The main trumpet melody has an interesting structure with a repeating 21-measure section with furious bass walking from Reed that hangs on longer notes and spots. There's a final super syncopated 14 measure section before Johnson is off on an agile solo. He gets a bit of edge in his tone as it goes along. Rottmeyer has an energetic piano solo here too. I like his phrasing on this one, stretching phrases over the fast tempo. And Johnson is back for another run through the melody to finish it off. Track five, Autumn Evening. Johnson sits out on this trio ballad with a pretty rubato solo intro from Rottmeyer. It gets into tempo with Reed and Andres joining in on the main 30 measure melody. Let's hear it get going.
after the melody, Rottmeyer continues on, improvising, showing a really nice touch and great phrasing with melodic ideas. And Reed has a bass solo that reaches way up high for a 12-measure section, and Rottmeyer is back to finish off the melody in a lovely rubato fashion with some final tasty bass from Reed. Track 6 is Song of Modes. This is kind of in the spirit of Song of Songs from the 1972 Woody Shaw album of the same name. That had Mysterious Flute from Emmanuel Boyd on the amorphous opening. Here we get ghostly bowing from Reed over rippling piano and soft modal phrases from Johnson. Let's take a listen. Oh, you can hear it get into tempo there and then into the main melody it will go. There's a nice 6-8 groove and the melody is 16 measures, then four more measures of the piano vamp before the melody repeats. Johnson is off on an improvised solo with a lot of interesting modal lines and phrases, so let's hear some of his playing later on in the tune. Rottmeyer is next with a solo that has a lot of rhythmic bounce too before Johnson returns with the melody and some final modal explorations. Track 7 is Ballerina Dance, I think inspired by Katerina Ballerina from United. This is a gentle and pensive tune with a light 6-8 feel. The 8-measure intro has neat bass harmonic intervals from Reed. The melancholy minor trumpet melody has a repeating 12-measure section, then an 8-measure piano bridge before repeating again. Rottmeyer solos first, working up intensity gradually and with a graceful touch to his lines. Let's hear a bit of his solo on this tune. Johnson has an adventurous solo next on this tune as well, getting up into the high register with reaching lines, and he quotes a bit of the Caterina Ballerina melody toward the end of his solo. Things chill out and get quiet for the start of a final run through the melody. 
Track eight. I want to say something about this before you say it. It's called La Seizième. And I think that refers to the 16th arrondissement. La Seizième means the 16th. 16th, yeah. And the, the 16th arrondissement in Paris, where the uh, Bois de Boulogne is. And it's also where the wealthiest section of Paris is, like the Passy. And in the Passy Cemetery is where Claude Debussy is buried. So I bet this is a reference to that. I'm wondering. Maybe he'll let mm. us know. This is another trio tune that Johnson sits out on. It's built around a simple eight-measure progression in 6-8. After a four-measure intro, Rottmeyer goes around the short melody twice and is off on improvisations. It really builds up momentum to a nice chugging feel. And Andres gets a drum solo on this one with subtle snare work. Rottmeyer finishes it up with a couple more times around the melody and a trickily piano ending. And track nine, this is uh, The Oldest Bridge. And it's called Pont Neuf, which means new bridge. Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Rubato piano over ringing bass makes a spacious opening. It comes into an even beat tempo with a light Latin feel to bring Johnson in on the happy 32 measure melody. Rottmeyer solos first, and Reed has another ringing bass solo before Johnson is back on the melody that slows to a rubato piano ending. That one, by the way, the Pont Neuf leads uh, both the right and left bank to the Ile de la Cité, which is where the Notre Dame Cathedral is. Oh. So it's right in the center of Paris. There's another street here, too, in Paris to finish up. We're staying right in Paris. Yeah, and Rue de Lombard. And this is important. You should know this. You should memorize this street because it's got the three most famous jazz clubs in Paris are on that street. Le Baiser Salé, which means the Salty Kiss. Le Duc de Lombard and the Sunset or the Sunside or Sunset Sunside. So when you're in Paris, you want to remember... Rue de Lombard for a good night out for the adult music podcast where you can hear good jazz. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> All right, yeah. If only the, the yen to euro exchange rate were better. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this is a cool little minor tune with some nice harmonic twists. After an eight measure drum intro, Johnson picks up into the melody. It's an AABA structure, but the A sections are 10 measures, which gives it a nice little stretch and break. Johnson gets a break into a solo from there. So let's hear this final tune get going. to the trumpet solo there. Rottmeyer follows on piano, so let's hear some of his solo on this tune. into a drum solo from Andres there, who gets a lot of time to work around the kit. He's subtle and quick. And then Johnson is back for once more around the melody to end the recording. 
Hmm. So these tunes came out of a study of Mulgrew Miller's recordings with Woody Shaw, but the result here is something fresh and lively. If you know those recordings by Woody Shaw, you'll recognize some of the allusions to those tunes. Rottmeyer is a classy pianist. He has great phrasing and melodic ideas, and his left-hand work is really interesting. Johnson's trumpet solos are exciting because he takes a lot of chances and finds surprising lines through the difficult harmonic passages. Great driving bass lines and ringing solos from Rufus Reed, who, by the way, is 80 years old now. Wow. Still sounding great. And tight and exact drumming from Matt Andres. This was my jazz album of the week. I liked it a lot. And... It's the playing and the clarity of the recording, but it's also, you know, I kind of felt like I was kind of on the uh, Paris uh, Metro there, kind of seeing all those uh, titles. It kind of reminded me of my time there. The recording was warm. The bass especially added to that quality, I thought. There's a lot of class in the playing as well as the sound. I like the classy piano playing by Rottmeier. He's a really, yeah, he's got a really great sound and approach. And I like the spaciousness of the piano on Autumn Evening. Mm -hmm. I like the way sudden emphatic chords would end many of the tracks. That seems to be a thing he liked doing. You know, it was like, whoa, you can jump out of your seat for a minute. Uh, It became a kind of a fingerprint on the album, those uh, sudden endings. There's a lot of music on this album. It was way over like 70 minutes long. But given its quality, that only makes it better. I really would like to pick this one up, Mm. actually. Yeah, nice recording. All right, and on to our final recording. Something a little different here from the group called Daggerboard. New recording, Escapement. This is on Wide Hive Records, came out March 8th. So the connection here is back to Woody Shaw again. Last year in episode 114, Fabulous Frets, we discussed Jason Kaiser's Shaw's Groove, which made our best of the year list. And the trumpet player on that recording was Eric Jacobson, who we'll hear on this recording and who did all the arranging here as well. This is the third Daggerboard recording. 2021, they had The Last Days of Studio A. 2022, Daggerboard and The Skipper. The Skipper being the bassist here, Henry Franklin. And all the music on this recording is composed by Eric Jacobson and Gregory Howe, the producer at White Hive Records. And we did, uh, what was it, Calvin Key's recording on White Hive Records. Yeah, we really that liked was a great that recording. Record. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got Henry, the Skipper Franklin, on bass, Eric Jacobson on trumpet and flugelhorn, Gregory Howe on, I think, miscellaneous percussion, and who knows what else he does a lot of things uh, in the studio there as well. Matt Clark on keyboards, the great Mike Clark of Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters fame on drums on this recording. We've got strings, Mads Tolling on violin, Evan Price on violin, and Cullen Looper also on violin, Ben Davis on cello. Casey Knudsen on alto sax, Sheldon Brown on bass clarinet, clarinet and flute, Mike Rinta on trombone and tuba, Jonathan Ring on French horn, William Wenant on marimba, timpani and glockenspiel, and Babatunde Lea on congas. Now I had to look around to get all the personnel on most of the listings, even on the Wide Hive site doesn't have the complete personnel but luckily I was able to pull that out of a list and it's different on each track so I hope I got all the names there. The recording begins with centrifugal and there's a lot going on right from the start (laughs) on this tune. Mm. A sense of unstoppable motion in the 5-4 rhythm with a hypnotic bass line. Rhythmic marimba, thick horns and string layers. Jacobson's trumpet lines float above all that. So let's just get right in from the beginning so you can get an idea of what this is going to sound like.
Jacobson's improvised solo on this tune is very cool with chromatic tension and a nice release when you hear that change of mode come around again that we heard right there. Very lyrical phrasing as well. Matt Clark has a piano solo with lines skittering up and down the keyboard, tremolos and punchy chords, and Mike Clark gets a drum solo on this one too. The bass drum really booms out on this track. The trumpet lines and thick arrangements are back for a final section. At the ending where the strings stand out, it shifts to a six beat meter from the five. The movements are connected here to the next track and Wynant has timpani rolls into track two, which is the title track, Escapement. There are busy rhythmic horn lines over pressing snare drum and strings and more timpani. Flute and French horn tones stand out here. It's short at two minutes and 21 seconds and takes us to track three, climbing in the cocoon. Now we're in a 7-4 meter with another hypnotic bass line and washy Rhodes piano from Matt Clark. Jacobson takes the lyrical melody here, so let's hear this track get going. drum break takes it to a new section with strings under the trumpet lines before it returns to the original theme. Clark gets an atmospheric road solo that pans between left and right and might make you dizzy in headphones. And let's hear Jacobson's solo that follows that on this tune. final section with strings under the trumpet line switches to a 6-8 feel here too, and the strings hold out into the next track, which is called Shiva's Mode. And things get started with some bass clarinet, which is always a good thing for us. A low and fun minor modal start into an enchanting beat. Add the trumpet on top for a seductive melody. Let's hear it get going.
It gets a bit of bluesy infusion into the modes there, and there are bass clarinet solos from Sheldon Brown, a piano solo from Matt Clark, and Jacobson has a cool one as well. Sounds like on flugelhorn here. The ending gets a little extra bass bounce and a busy drum beat. The next track, five, is the balance board, a slow measured beat for this one with conga filling in the feel. Jacobson has the melody, and things get busy with drum fills from Mike Clark between rhythmic repeated horn notes with string glissandos. Clark gets a great funky groove working with Franklin's bass for a trumpet solo from Jacobson and a piano solo from Matt Clark. Let's check out some of the piano solo on this tune. Some nice backing horn lines behind the piano, and there Jacobson returns with the melody lines backed by more horns and strings to the end. Track six is Returning the Pendulum. Winds and strings are arranged nicely on this short track with just cymbals, ringing glockenspiel, and a timpani climax underneath. Track seven is Olivia One. Rhodes, a bass ostinato, and conga make a basis for some echoey trumpet and alto sax improvisations from Casey Knudsen. A new funky groove forms in the bass for a while with horn hits and Rhodes before the original feel returns for a longer Rhodes solo into some interesting rhythmic sax and trumpet lines. Track 8 is called Distant Sirens. More Rhodes on this one over some tom work from Mike Clark to get this started before happy horn lines come in. Let's hear the beginning of this tune. The marimba and beat give a little bit of a calypso feel to it. Knudsen has some cool sax that takes it through a new section, and drums in conga get a little section into a return of the horn lines and a vamping fade to the end. Track 9 is called Concrete Dim. This is a fully arranged track and creates a sense of tension with repeated rhythmic piano and bass in the intro. Interesting tonal layers of horns are added in the arrangement, and the horns take over the rhythmic riff idea, and there are weeping violin lines. It pushes on in a similar fashion to the end. Track 10 is Petra Corinda. This one has a great bass line groove from Franklin and conga adding to the atmosphere under Jacobson's melody into a break and funky piano lines into a horn arrangement. Let's hear the tune get started.
After the horn section there, Jacobson gets a short trumpet solo going, but then Franklin soon takes over on bass. Oh, let's hear a little bit of his playing in the solo on this tune. Clark gets a piano solo with some horn backing lines there, and there's a section of arranged horn lines, and Mike Rinta gets the final solo on trombone on this tune. Track 11 is Certified Clockwork, a kind of 9-8 feel here with Rhodes triplets under Jacobson's trumpet at the start. Bass clarinet joins in the rhythmic fun too. It's kind of a unique rhythmic feel going on here. Let's hear it get started. Legato horn arrangement where the feel shifts into four and then a Rhodes solo, an alto sax solo from Knudsen and Jacobson on trumpet. An arranged horn section takes it to a drum solo from Mike Clark with added conga. So let's hear the drum solo on this track. And the Rhodes is back with the opening rhythmic idea, and there's some final horn lines to the end of the tune. And the recording finishes up with track 12, All Cool in the Wheelhouse, a lush arrangement of horns and strings over a neat groove here, and Rinta's tuba really sticks out on this tune at the beginning. So let's hear the start of this one. Thank you. 
Well, it moves on with some volleying horn lines and some flute and glockenspiel stand out tonally. Jacobson hangs out of that horn line into a relaxed solo. So let's hear one more from him before we get to the end of the recording. Clark follows there on piano. The horn arrangement with volleying lines is back and develops with a thick arrangement ending in some interesting rhythmic horn figures. And that wraps up the recording. The recording has unique instrumentation, creative and constantly evolving arrangements from Jacobson and great grooves from Mike Clark and Henry Franklin. There are interesting tonal surprises that pop out at you from bass clarinet, tuba, French horn, flute, glockenspiel. Jacobson's solos are inspired and varied, taking the spotlight here, but Matt Clark's piano and Knudsen's alto sax also have good spots. Also, this is a recording that you need to listen to in its entirety from start to finish to experience the journey, and the sound hangs over and connects a bit. That's something that people don't do enough of these days with all the streaming playlists and mixing up of tunes that they like. But definitely set aside the time to hear this as a connected and continuous album of music. I think it'll be a rewarding listen. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Eric Jacobson, who follows us on Facebook, says about it. Yeah, I feel like those algorithms are anti-art. <laughs> you, know, you can't really have <laughs> make a big artistic statement with them because they just kind of destroy it. I have some words to say about that about our podcast too, but that's for another episode. All right. Anyway, I thought this was really unusual for a jazz album. It's a very high gloss, and you usually don't get that out of a jazz record as far as production goes. Mm. All the rhythms feature like ostinato patterns. I shouldn't say all, but a lot of them do. Mm. And the playing is very stylish. I kind of heard a lot of those a Steve Reich influence in this. You know, not really? just jazz, mm. but like the kind of minimalist sort of like repeating patterns sort of thing that he does. Right. And I wonder if they had that in mind because there are some times where I really could hear his fingerprint in there. I'd say there was like a real like classical minimalist vibe if well, maybe influence would be the better word on the album. It's unique as far as jazz albums that we've been hearing on this podcast anyway. I feel like the album is more about its overall sound than about the individual players. It's right. more about the ensemble. So that makes me think more classical too. The entire album is fairly gentle and sound throughout. Nothing that's going to make uh, your neighbors angry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was good. I thought it was interesting. It's not really what I would normally listen to, but I was really kind of happy to make its acquaintance. It's kind of a chilled out record that wants you to feel some soothing vibes. Yeah, I liked it for the uniqueness of it. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, I'll pick up an episode of big band music. And of course, mm -hmm. the arranging there is always interesting to focus on. But here you get some kind of unique instrumentation. And, you know, we've done a few albums with kind of cool octets and maybe up to 10 players. Here you've got a real big ensemble of changing instrumentation. And I like those tones. I like to hear the tuba in the bass roll a little bit. And we got the bass clarinet in there as well. French horn is always nice to have mixed in with the horns for some tonal color. There's clarinet and flute in here as well. So hearing those different tones and this really cool rhythm section with Mike Clark and uh, Henry Franklin together sets down those cool grooves. Even in these little bit odd meters, they just sound all natural. And so I think it must have been kind of inspiring to blow some solos over for Eric Jacobson. So definitely check this out. Check out the previous recordings as well. All right, that about wraps up this episode of 157. And next week, we'll be back with 158. We're recording a day early this week, and I haven't picked my jazz picks for next week. Can you give any hints for the classical picks, Mike? We got some uh, adult music favorites in the classical, and we've got C.P.E. Bach. There's a new recording by the All Academy right. für Alte Musik. 
Berlin, so that always entertains us. And those are going to be his symphonies. He's got a new uh, Beatrice Rana, another preferred pianist by the Adult mm-hmm. Music Podcast, her new recording of two mammoth works by Chopin and Beethoven. Right. And then we have a contemporary composer, Richard Baker. His album is called The Tyranny of Fun, and that title really <laughs> jumped out at me. And we haven't done a contemporary composer in a while, so it's I want to yeah. make sure we get one on there. So, yeah, hopefully I'll get back into that groove. Right. I like people hearing new music. Richard Baker. Okay. I have no idea, so looking forward to checking yeah, that out. Yeah, I don't know anything about him, so there you go. All right, well, I'll get the jazz sorted out tomorrow. And if you want to find out what that is ahead of time, you want to start listening to that. It'll all be on a playlist on Deezer with a link to it from our Facebook page shortly after this episode gets published on Monday. As always, thanks to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo. And don't forget to check out the same difference to jazz fans, one jazz standard podcast. And remember to get French fry. <laughs> You're doing it too now. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it too. I think we wanted to say Frenchified. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, but yeah. I like French fried better. With all that uh, ketchup on them, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> or mayonnaise, I guess. As they, I actually like yeah. prefer it with mayonnaise, but oh, really? you know, mm. yeah, that's just going to disgust my American friends. But <laughs> you know, I live for that. <laughs> all right. Well, keep listening. And we'll see you again next week for episode 158. Same difference. Two jazz fans, one jazz standard. A review of a single jazz standard through music, history, and stories. And this is AJ. And this is Johnny. If you are a jazz fan and you like jazz standards, bebop, show tunes, ballads, you name it. Yeah, we've got them here. We drop a new show on you every other week, and we take a standard, and we listen to a few different versions of it. Same difference. Come join the fun. Looking forward to seeing you. 